Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 12, 2020, and this is a week in charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. It looks like our numbers are slowly rising once again, so people are finding the link. So that's a good thing. If you watch the recording of this, you just can't simply find a link, please let me know. We used to have many more people here, so I'm not sure what happened along the way. Obviously, we talk about current market conditions. That's left over from recently and uh, the beginning and end, I think it's um uh, you know media calls a bear market 20 percent we're obviously there your questions on trading if you don't mind keep them to the stop uh, keep them to the slides and when we get to the live chart you can ask about anything you want or towards the end of the show and open it up for questions feel free to ask and that's just to keep my ADD from kicking in when we get to the yeah my mic's on Charles your uh turn your speakers up Turn your speakers up, Charles. Charles. It's funny. Sometimes I'll do that and uh, people are like, oh, I can hear you now. <laughs> anyway, wait until we get to the live charts for your favorite stock picks. And if you don't mind, ask about one at a time. And that's for your benefit. So what I want to do this week is kind of pick up on what I did yesterday and just kind of give you a Reader's Digest, kind of a thumbnail, what I did yesterday in my Trading Simplified show over at the stock charts tv and i want to talk about the the trading model and that's what we talked about yesterday my model account or whatever you want to call it the core trading service and me how we are surviving this bear market before we do all that as claim screen as you know you can lose money trading and believe me i know that very well or as often summing up all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen to me now and then so before we get into the market and all this other stuff, I want to talk a little bit more on the market being a bad teacher. So three months ago, I think it was three months ago, it might have been a little bit longer, but a guy in the gym found out what I did through another guy, and um, they were or they were talking stocks and stupid me, I couldn't just keep my mouth shut. And the gym guy's like, "Well, I'm long these three pot stocks, and I'm down 50 percent." And so this guy's a little younger guy. So I thought, well, here's a teachable moment. And I said, let's say you have, well, first of all, I said, you have to treat your stocks like employees. As long as they're working, keep them. But if they stop working, you want to get rid of them. And, and um, I forget exactly what I said, but I, something along the lines of, you have to treat your stocks like employees. Suppose, suppose you have four employees three are busting their ass and one is sitting on his ass, would you keep him because he is due to work soon? Or would you, and before I could get through with my sentence, this guy interrupts and says, I fired his ass. I'm like, all right. So I'm thinking like, I'm thinking that, okay, well, this guy gets it. I think I just, in 30 seconds or less, taught this guy how to trade. So I told him to treat your stocks like employees. Now, three months later, and there's a lot that transpired in between, and part of which was that I, you know, because he's a younger guy, didn't have a whole lot of money. I'm thinking, you know what? Or assuming he didn't have a lot of money. I said, you know what? Let me give him access to the learning management system and give him my books and, and just kind of maybe a, a, an article or two. And then also looking at his, his portfolio, I'm like, well, who's going to get fired in your portfolio? I'm giving him a few examples of portfolios where you've got three or four stocks working and one not doing so well. And I thought I was getting somewhere, but three months later, in other words, yesterday, we have yet the market is another bad teacher. So I'm like, Hey, what did you do with those pot stocks? And he's like, oh, I sold them and bought some good stocks. Now, he rode those pot stocks down much further than 50%. And I have them somewhere written down. And one day I'll dust them off and take a look at them. But he said, oh, I sold them and bought some good stocks. And I'm thinking, like, in this market, good stocks? What the hell could that be? I was like, really? Which ones? And he said, PayPal and Microsoft. Well, here is PayPal. And you could subtract another 8% probably from that because I did this capture before the open. And here is Microsoft. And again, you could subtract another 
8% from that. So human nature never seems to change. And that's one thing I'm trying to wrap my head around. And it's funny. I don't know. I wish I would have gotten off my bot talks. Not for you guys. He's like, you guys are traders. But for the general person, like this friend of my wife's, she's a very successful entrepreneur, but she doesn't know what to do with her money. I mean, that's a great problem to have, right? And these financial managers are telling her things like, oh, you got to be in for the long haul and you can't, can't get shaken out and all this other stuff, blah, blah, blah. And she was reaching out to me for advice. And I'm thinking like, boy, I really need to put her article out there. And I, and I actually started the article, but didn't get around to finishing it before this big slide. So now I kind of hate to put it out. It looks like it was in, in hindsight. It's, it's on the back end of my website. Anyway, it just made me think about how human nature doesn't change. People are already asking me about bargain hunting on stocks. And I'm seeing these idiots on the internet. I made the mistake of replying to one, so God knows what's going to happen there. But like putting out videos about how you got to buy and hold. Uh, quoting of Warren Buffett, that makes me absolutely nuts. Berkshire Hathaway, I don't know how they're going to come out of this, but they occasionally lose over half of their money. And then you could argue that they're no longer really a value investing firm because they deal in derivatives and all kinds of crazy swaps and deals and stuff like that. But I don't want to dig myself into that hole. But these people glom on to this buy and hold thing, and they also attach themselves to like the Warren Buffett philosophy and and all these things and don't get shaken out. And it makes me it makes me nut up a little bit, truth be told. Anyway, before I digress too far, I know too late. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details of this system. I just want to give you an update, but for those who are watching this video for the first time, here's the rules. I have a plethora of presentations that cover these rules. We're basically getting out when the market is more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high and closing below its 50-week moving average. And then we get in when it's within 10% of its 50-week closing high and you have a little momentum and that momentum is the two lows for two weeks. The lows are greater than the moving average and that's what I call Landry light. Anyway, here's the last sell signal. We sold off coming into that December slide. And by the way, a lot of bad hate behavior back then if I was, if memory serves, I think that's when I was renting a U-Haul. No, I'm sorry. I was renting a U-Haul in January and I went into the U-Haul place and the guy had on CNBC and I'm like, hey, I dabble a little bit in the markets. You trade? He's like, oh yeah, man. I, I'm so glad that I held on through December and I wish I would have bought more. And it's like, well, geez, you know, that'll work until it don't. And that December slide was a pretty ugly slide. And even if you got whipsawed on that, congratulations for get out, getting out of the way. As my good friend Greg Morris often says, <laughs> I can't say, he sent a funny email out this morning. I guess I better not get myself in trouble. He said, uh, he said due to coronavirus, he's washing his hands more, not because of the coronavirus, but because the lack of toilet paper. Anyway, that's Greg. He's funny. Uh, <laughs> So as Greg says, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. So anyway, there's the buy signal. The uh, good folks over at stockcharts.com are working on these indicators for me. The bottom one says Landry pullback, but that's gonna that should that should be like percent away from 50 week closing high, or depending on how the parameters work out, maybe just say percent off highs. So I would have worked with the programmer as time allows. There's just so much going on right now. It's hard to do all these things. But anyway, your sell signal was up there in the 3000s on this. And I was kind of amazed at how fast this thing triggered. This thing triggered before, long before the daily bow tie sell signal triggered. And I just find it absolutely fascinating. We'll take a look at some of these things in the live charts. Now, as I've said ad nauseum, my initial goal with this system I mean, I wanted to beat buy and hold, don't get me wrong. That was my initial motivation for this system. But my initial goal was to avoid these diaper change moments. Now, diaper change, I'm stealing that from the late and great Ian McActivy. I hope there's some recordings of his presentations out there somewhere. 
this guy, he inspires me so much. He did these, he would make the funniest presentations and I don't know how he did it, where he got the graphics or whatever, or pictures, just funny as hell. But anyway, he talked about kind of these black swanish type events in one of his presentations and he would show what would happen or what had happened. And it's like, uh, these were diaper change moments. Well, losing half of your account over a fairly short period of time, which does happen in the markets. And everybody's like, hold on, man, just hold on. Don't get shaken out. I don't know why I'm talking about Bill Clinton, but anyway. But you can see, obviously, the last 30 years, a couple of times the market's lost about half of its value. Will it lose half its value now? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But when I was putting together my stock chart show yesterday or day before, I noticed that as this number down here, the diaper change was only at about 10% gets bigger, but putting in today's 8% loss a little while ago, then this system looks a lot better than buy and hold. So just by avoiding that diaper change moment, you're going to do a lot better than buy and hold. And what's amazing is if you get these, as this thing grows and grows, and then you get a bigger and bigger diaper change, which you're out of the market for, then that's going to make the buy and hope number smaller and those gains look a lot better. I remember when, usually we put, you know, you, you, if you want to make a system stop working, publish it. <laughs> it just seems like not because, not because people will follow it because nobody's going to follow it. All right. But it just seems like what happens is you do all this research, which is based on this hypothetical crap going back in time. And then when you walk forward with it, it just doesn't seem to work as well because the past is not the future. And that's one reason I'm not a huge fan of mechanical systems like this, but they can help to wrap your head around what's going on with the market. So we got a sell signal really fast at this. I'm like, whoa, Dave something's happening in this market that's kind of crazy here like what is going on and i was amazed that we had this mechanical system and you know on the flip side back in march of 2019 when this thing triggered a long signal on march 1st actually somebody in the facebook group pointed out we had a signal and i'm like no 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 you silly little bull there's no way we could have a signal. And, and lo and behold, I checked the charts and it was a signal. And I was kind of surprised because I was still feeling a little bearish. The point I'm trying to get to, my cage just flipped out, I just said bearish. The point I'm trying to get to is that don't rush out and mechanically follow something, okay? But have something mechanical to help you find your way. Have something objective to help you find your way. You can look at moving average daylight on, let's say, a 50-week moving average if you want. That'll help to keep you on the right side of the market. The weekly bow ties will help to keep you on the right side of the market, whatever the market may be. And just find something. And, and again, don't, don't trade mechanically. We have a brain in our head. And we can work to pick stocks and use some discretion and all these other great things but something mechanical can really help you to stay on the right side of the market so anyway this number down here which isn't going to get any larger also isn't going to get any smaller okay until we buy back in is looking better and better and better and better and better that number on top i was surprised at how fast that number shrank so one point i wanted to make earlier before i lost my train of thought was if you go back to March or before March, this system did not look as good as it does today. So this walk forward at real time testing exemplifies how important it is to avoid those diaper change moments. Now, keep in mind that you do lose at least 10% of your open profits or whatever the case may be, 10% of your account that you have, whatever you have in the, in the market, overall market S&P 500, you do lose 10% until you stop out, at least 10%, okay? Depends on where the 50-week moving average is. So that 18% number, that would be on top of the 10% you already lost. So you can see here, 
it stopped out at a 9% gain. All right, it's better than the poke in the eye, but it was up probably 19%-ish before it stopped out. But you know what? 9% is better than an 18% loss, and that's from where you exited. So you could add another probably 8% to that or 10% to that. So that's a 28, that would be like a 28% loss versus a 9% gain. Now, what I did yesterday was got up really early. Well, I get up early every day, so that's, that's nothing new. But what I decided to do was I got kind of off on a tangent on research, and I went back to the 1900s, and I started backfilling in this spreadsheet, and eventually I'll get it done. If one of you guys want, wants to finish it, that'd be awesome. And anyway, one of the things I noticed was it did exit right before the Great Depression. Now, one thing that's beautiful with this little simple system, and I'm not selling you on it, okay, because I'm giving it away, but what's beautiful with it, the system is that every crash so far, it has gotten you out of the way fairly quickly. I can't guarantee that that, that will always work. But so far, so good. Every crash, every bear market, you've gotten out relatively unscathed. So if you don't learn anything from this, when a market drops 10% off its highs, you better think really long and hard if you want to stay long, okay? And then if you're a little bit smarter, take a look at the moving average that's built into the system and see where you are and figure out when you might want to think about getting out of the market. Now, in the individual portfolios, I use an ebb and flow approach. In other words, I use stops to take me out of the stinkers. I also use initial profit targets to exit half of the shares. So case in point, AMD. So AMD, we have a profit target of 37. And, you know, the market's kind of coming unglued today. There's a chance it might hit it, but that might just it might just go down there and tag it. And there's no, you know, I would hope, oh geez, I hope, you know, I hope the market doesn't continue to implode, obviously. I do want the market to go up. So to those of you who are newer to trading and you see me shorting, that's just me being a trader, okay? And remember, I do have to buy back eventually. So just think of that as future buying if you're having a hard time wrapping your head around that. But you have to be willing to take those initial profit targets because believe me, this this market will have some really serious bounces along the way. And you you better make darn sure you're taking some partial profits out. Anyway, getting back to this system, going back to the Great Depression, the market lost 83% of its value after the exit. So the diaper change would be 83%. And this is what that looks like. So right below that moving average, if you squint your eyes, you can see the closing price. That was the exit, and then that is an 83% loss that you would have avoided. Now, all this is in hindsight, but hey, you know what? I launched this thing back in late 2018, maybe? I, I forget, but you can go in and watch the YouTube videos. So you could say everything before that's in hindsight, but so far, it's actually done fairly well, even though you did have what you might want to call what some people would call a whipsaw. Now that whipsaw, if you look at the, I think it was a Russell 2000, dropped another 18% or something from that level. Don't quote me on that, but the numbers are pretty big. It was a pretty serious drop, even though it doesn't look that bad in the spreadsheet. Okay, any questions on any of this or any thoughts in general? I'm probably watching that screen too much. Hey, Stuart, you have a question? Yes, okay, go ahead, shoot. Yes to watching the screen too much or yes to have a question? while we're waiting on Stuart. Now, one thing that I've been talking about quite a bit lately, and I did the whole show yesterday on the stock chart show on letting the ebb and flow control your portfolio. And more specifically, how did the model account fare? The model account is my core trading service. Every day I put out a trading service, which contains my personal watch list and what I think has potential. Now, as you'll see in one second, I do take some what riskier trades outside of the core service. I do take some IPOs and things that might set up somewhat outside the core methodology, but my ultimate goal with the core trading service is to follow the basic swing to intermediate term trend following. And it's almost like a game. How good can I be with this? Or how much, obviously how much money can I make and how can I prove 
and continue to prove that this all works. So let's take a look at the portfolio coming into all this mess. And this is a summary of yesterday's show. By the way, I put up a link. This will this will probably call the bottom of the market, but I put up a link on the menu of my website called Bear Market Update. And I'll include today's week in charts in that. And I've got yesterday's show, if you're looking for that show, for stock charts, where we talked a lot about this in a lot more detail. And I'm gonna throw some other articles in there about buy and hold and some other things too. So this is where we were in the portfolio coming in to this big slide. And this is where we ended up afterwards. So if we do the math on that, that's 19,155 minus 13,159. We have a loss of roughly $6,000, but there were some stocks that stopped out. And by the way, some things in here with a tiny bit of discretion would actually still be short, believe it or not. And I guess in one case long, but anyway, just following the model mechanically, okay, just to just so there's no argument whether or not it works, you would have locked in and you had some losses too, but overall, since this mess began, you would have locked in 3560 based on the spreadsheet. And so you add that in. So since this mess began, we have a loss of 2436. Now, coming into this, we were short two stocks. And then everything else with the number one in front of it, one is long and minus one is short. And that's if you want the spreadsheet, I do, I do make it available. If you're already a member of DaveLander.com, just go to Members Resources. Anyway, so we had two shorts on. Even though the market was going up, it's like, but Dave, the market was going up. Why were you shorting? Well, I had a couple of setups that I liked. It was actually, I think, three of them all together that I liked, even though the market was going higher. Now, I'm going to err on the side of the longer-term trend, and I'm also going to make darn sure that I really like the short before I put it on, because I don't want to fight the market to be obstinate, right? So that's what the portfolio looked like before. This is what it looks like now. So all we have is one long left, which actually stopped out this morning. And I'm still long for what it's worth based on a little bit of discretion, just because the world was coming unglued. So now one long and one, two, three, four shorts, okay? So now we have flipped over to the short side. Now, if we look at the market, the market, I've got 19% in here. It's actually probably about 28%. We'll take a look at that in just one second to see how far this market has actually really dropped. But it's even more than 19%. Now, as Greg Morris often says, you can't eat relative performance. And as I said yesterday, what, it, what that means is let's say that you the market is down 60%, which could happen, but your portfolio manager has beat the market and he's only down 50%. And you're thinking about retiring, but now you have half the money that you had before. So the fact that he beat the market by 10% doesn't help you much. So as long as that number is negative, I'm not happy, obviously, is what I'm trying to say. But losing 2% in the market versus... Oh, I know I have 19% in here because I wanted to make a point. Versus 19%, it's it ain't that bad. And that comes from, I think I've told the story a thousand times, but before I moved, I had a brewery in a garage and and it, it cost me a, a bloody fortune. And then just probably to make a glass of beer is probably, I, I don't always up the number to exaggerate, but the reality is probably $10 a glass. And this guy was at a party. We were having a crawfish party and I brought the beer and I was like, mind if I try one of your beers? I'm like, yeah, go right ahead. You know, and he took a sip. He goes, well, this ain't too bad. I'm like, oh, geez. You know, he's drinking $10 a glass craft beer. <laughs> so anyway, 2.04% versus 19% drop ain't too bad. And here's the thing. Will we get back into the black? Now, let me digress for a minute. In an ideal world, the market kind of makes a gradual rollover. In fact, it's unusual for a market to just drop straight from its highs like it did and implode. It feels like it does that all the time during these crashes. So you know, I'm making air quotes in the air, doing these so-called crashes. 
But if you go back and look at a lot of them, 2007 especially was a beautiful rollover. It kind of looks like this little hypothetical rollover that I drew in here. In fact, by then, back then, we were buying and taking initial profit targets. And then I couldn't find anything to buy to save my life. And I actually started seeing some shorts. And I have to listen to the database. I have to practice what I preach, right? So I started putting some shorts on the service and then they started working. And then we began getting stopped out in our longs. And before you know it, we were fully short and taking initial profit targets. So in an ideal world, this is what it looks like. In an ideal world, it's like 2007. 2000 is, I, mean, I keep calling it 2007. I guess it was 2008, but I call it 2007 because that's when the market turned. And I wasn't like out there pontific pontificating that this is the end of the world and we need to get all crazy short. It was just like, hey guys, I can't find any longs. Here's a short or two. Let's just see what happens. And we're just going to sit on our hands until we figure out what's going on. And then, oh, how? Now the market's rolling over. That's why we saw these shorts. A lot of times that database speaks long before the market. And that's why I'm a huge fan of going through a couple of thousand charts every day. You really get a feel for what's going on. And if you want to get serious about your trading, I would encourage you to do the same thing. And if you if you contact me offline, I'll give you some links and help you get set up to do those things. And I'll even give you my exact scans. Now, keep in mind, those scans produce like 2,000 charts a day. So they're not going to, it's not going to narrow it down to a very small number. You're still going to do your work. Now, I punched in some numbers this morning. And the portfolio, based on a snapshot this morning, has gone up a little bit. It's gone up by $506, okay? The KOD stopped out, so I put the stop in there, tracking things mechanically at the opening price. But then I put in the prices of the shorts, which are much less today than they were yesterday. So that nets out to a $506 gain from that portfolio I showed a few minutes ago. So getting back to the that ain't too bad, the loss is now 1.62% versus a 25% loss mark to market. Now, again, you can't eat relative performance. I can't go to the store tonight and use a negative 1.62% to buy some steaks to feed my family, right? But it's a hell of a lot better than losing 25%. So 2.04% or more accurately, minus 1.62%, that ain't too bad. So anything, I hate to say this, but anything less than 2%, I consider almost noise. So I'm thinking that one good move in one stock could certainly eradicate that loss and would get the model account back in black. So the question is, where am I? Well, I'm doing much worse than that because I traded this account, this particular account, a little bit more aggressively. And this one's right around 100K, so I'm able to follow a lot of the stuff, or I try, my, my goal is to follow everything exactly as a service, but sometimes through the use of puts and things like that, as opposed to outright shorting, it doesn't always work out. And here's where that portfolio is now that I add the shorts into it. So it's starting to look a little bit better, but it's still a pretty big loss. And believe me, I have a much bigger loss than what I'm showing you here. And I'm, I'm working because I have more than one account. What I'm working towards, and it's gonna take me a little while to get there, so be patient, but uh, Ray Dalio wrote a book called Principles, which I would urge you to read. It's a very good book. Go to www.davelandry slash books dash two dash read for more on that. And I'll get like 35 cents if you click on it, which I appreciate. But he talked about radical transparency. And I think that that would really, really help in the trading world to have somebody who's radically transparent and on, who's on the education side. So you could see what's going on, warts and all. And I, and I think I'm one of those guys that's willing to, to show you, especially when I'm not doing fantastic. So anyway, it's starting to improve a, a little bit when we put today's prices in and the loss is not nearly as bad because we had $6,000 in gains from the short side, okay? Now this is, like I said, roughly a, a 
100K account. So that puts us at 11,202. So you can see my aggressive trading has actually done worse. And in some cases, some discretion has kind of bit me in the ass because of the market drops 8% overnight. As a general statement though, discretion usually helps you out. Boy, Chief Orman really wound up today. So a couple of random thoughts on this, and then I wanna talk about, uh, I wanna get to your questions, which are stacking up. So the model is shown to prove that it can be done in good times and bad. And even if you follow it mechanically, even though I do recommend a tiny bit of discretion on top of this, for instance, you get stopped, you know, something like TSEO, you get nicked at 15 cents. Eh, you know, it's a hundred dollar stock, 15 cents. Let's just see what happens. Maybe give it a little bit of wiggle room. Don't throw caution to the wind. The good thing is through the Facebook group, I'm able to see that you guys are using some discretion and staying with these things and not getting shaken out on just kind of like a little bit of a noise move right around that stop or a stop, uh, what do they call it? A stop hunt. Now discretion does usually help the TSEO, the aforementioned TSEO would have done, would have added another 2K to the portfolio, which would actually put the portfolio in black, which would be amazing for this slide. And then I would be shouting it from the rooftops saying, okay, here's everything I said to do ahead of time, okay? Here's how it shook out. Market lost 30% and we're up a little bit. Not enough to start kissing each other, but we're up enough to show that, hey, this is a lot better on a relative basis and not only an absolute basis than the overall market. KOD, I put that in here because I did exercise discretion. I am still holding on to that. Market's getting annihilated overnight. Let's just see how everything opens. If it begins to rally a little bit, then I'll put the stop back in. The one thing I wanna show you is ebb and flow is key. Like in 2007, and I think I might have those archives available if you wanna go in and look at them just to make sure I'm not just making stuff up. But in 2007, like I said, I couldn't find a long to save my life and we started putting shorts on and the next thing you know, the market rolls over. This, this rollover has been a real pain in the ass, make no bones about it, because we really didn't see a whole lot of shorts setting up and then the longs just kept setting up, setting up, setting up and then Boy, it's been overused, you know, and it, I saw that Mark Cuban called it a black swan today. So everybody's all excited about Mark Cuban. I'm making a universal sign of, well, I can't say in the air. But anyway, but it, it, it that's it's being overused. But yeah, it is a black swan event, if you want to know, uh, if you have to label it something. But ebb and flow is key. And that means taking those initial profit targets, honoring those stops, listening to the database. If I've got hundreds of buy side setups and in one or two shorts, then maybe I need to pay attention to those buy side setups. And unless those shorts look fantastic, like I thought those they did coming into this, a few, a few of these, okay, going back several months, then I'm not going to take them because I'm not going to fight the overall market just to fight the overall market. Now, Here's the thing that I was kind of thinking about coming into this, and it doesn't soften a blow for me. Believe me, I, I, I get a little bummed out. I think it was like last week I said we were passing a car dealership. You know, my wife's kind of on me to get a new car, and it's like um, I was kind of quiet, and she's like, why are you quiet? You're always a chatty Cathy. What's going on? You know, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I bought a car with this money that I lost. You know, it's like, don't want to... <laughs> You know, the bad thing is when, when times are good, I, I let her know how good we're doing. And then when times are bad, I, I kind of don't uh, fully tell her everything as, as I think most of us do. And we've had long conversations about that in here in these weekend charts. But the thing is, one thing I'm trying to console myself a little bit with is my aggressive trading really paid off well until it didn't. So a lot of those profits were open profits. Now what sucks is I think my equity curve probably peaked on December 31st. <laughs> so uh, depending on what, what stocks that I stopped out of or whatever, or I took additional profit targets on, probably gonna have to pay a lot of taxes on an account that's losing money so far this year, okay? So, but that, but the point I'm trying to make is a lot of that money that was lost or all of the money that was lost was open profits, right? And it sucks, don't get me wrong, but at least it was, at least you're net net ahead of where you were several months back. So if you can look at your portfolio 
and your equity curve is at least ahead or maybe at least the same as it was several months back, especially after market crashes like this, then you have to feel pretty good about yourself. So again, my aggressive trading style really paid off until it didn't. But, you know, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I think I might go for a walk. Little Monty Python there. Okay, questions. Stuart says, on the second half, do you change your approach to waiting for the mother all drops in shorts or do you take profits have a 30% drop on your second half? Ah, uh, let me think about that. So what you're saying is, and let me maybe go to, I'll go to another question, but are you saying because the market's imploding, do you hold off on taking those initial profit targets? Well, the answer is, and, and I see you have another question in here, so let me let me flesh that out first. The answer is it depends, okay? And I know that's kind of a lame answer, but let me explain what I'm saying. Okay, so, so let's say we're short something and the IPT is down here and the market's kind of coming unglued. Well, if the market opens and it drops like a stone through that IPT and it keeps dropping, what I might do, and I think I'm answering a question you're not answering, not asking, but that's okay. And let's say this is another two points. I'm just pulling a number out the air, obviously. And my initial profit target is here. So I could put in, if this market's two points below that, I could put in like an automated trailing stop at two points. And if this thing continues to implode all day, and then I could exit on the close, okay? And worst case, unless something totally goes nuts, I'll get stopped out at that IPT. So this is a discretionary type of move to squeeze out, squeeze out more profits. Getting back to the discretionary thing, on the KOD, I went, and this was by luck too. I let it open and then it went, it, it blew past the initial profit target. And I actually put in a sell order just because I thought it was plenty, it had gone plenty far enough, right? Because it's, it's just way up there. I didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. And then it was halted and it kept going and going and going. And then finally I'm like up 30, 40 points or whatever the case may be. And I'm like, you know what? This is just ridiculous. I've, I've got to take these partial profits. Put in a second order and it was halted. And I think the third or fourth time it was halted. It was only halted three times, but the third time it was halted, I got out as soon as it opened up again. So the point I'm trying to make there is you don't necessarily want to be a greedy bass. And if it does implode the way down here or something, feel free to take those partial profits because you've beat the system, so to speak. Okay. Now let me get back to your question. Your approach, waiting for the mother ball drops in shorts or take profits after, say, on your second half. Okay, no. So and here's that's a good question, Stuart. So what Stuart's saying is, let me clear this out. Here's the problem on the short side. The short side is very hard to trend follow, okay? And the reason is because, let's say the market rolls over or whatever you're trading, you get short like right here, like a good little trend follower, and you're feeling pretty good. You have this big old retrace rally stops you out and then the market implodes, okay? In an ideal world, the market would just do this on the short side, kind of like it sometimes does in a great bull market where you just ride that trend for years and years and years so i think what stewart's asking and correct me if i'm wrong is let's say you get short like right here you got an ipt up here okay ipt he's saying do you exit those other shares let's say it drops 30 percent okay do you exit those other shares i'm gonna say no okay I like to follow the system the same way on the downside I do on the upside, okay? It makes life a lot easier, but I hear you because if you have this big implosion, you know you're gonna have the mother of all bounces. But the other thing that could happen, it could be in a keyword in that sentence is, what if there's truly something wrong with this company, okay? And then it goes down all the way to zero. So I would just continue to trend follow even though it's made a big, big move lower and you know you're likely to deal with a big old retrace, okay? All right, Stuart, I hope I, I know I answered like three different questions. Let me know if I answered your question. Charles says, many charts have already bow tied down from all time highs in dramatic fashion. It's too late considered for a 
short position even after the pullback. Uh, we'll have to take that on a case by case basis. Here's what sucks about the short side. Now I, I keep saying, and I've, I've written many pieces on this where I say, don't say one side of the market sucks versus the other. But unfortunately, the short side's hard not to do that. But here's the thing on the short side. So long side, it's kind of like this market's just, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, kind of like the little man on uh, Price is Right, the little uh, whatever he is, the little mountain man, you know. The market just kind of goes up and consolidates and goes up and consolidates. And then you have like like right here, you've got, hey, I've got this setup. Looks pretty good. I think I'm going to take it. And then, you know, right here, it's like, oh, I got this setup. I think I might take it. You know, it's like, oh, I have this setup. I think I might take it. And then, you know, you're taking profits along the way and you're trailing that stop higher and life is wonderful. Okay. So that's, this is a good life. Okay. This has me riding by car dealerships, right? The short side, it's like it all goes at once, okay? So we got short three stocks in two days, I think. But you're right. It's going to be really hard because ideally on the short side, market makes all-time highs, has to sell off a bow tie or whatever. You get short right here, okay, in a stock, individual stocks, right? That's an ideal world as opposed to having a stock way down here somewhere, use your imagination, way down here and then bouncing off the lows. Now, if we stay in a prolonged bear market, or if we don't rally much, then we might be stuck buying these stocks, I'm sorry, shorting these stocks at lower levels as opposed to shorting them ideally at these higher levels, okay? So if you look at the portfolio, and we'll we'll take a look at these shorts in just one second, you'll see that they all just imploded at the same time. And we made a lot of money really fast, but in an ideal world, I'd like to have 10 or 12 shorts on, okay? So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but as we go through, if you have any individual issues you wanna look at, we'll take a look at that, okay? Stuart says, if you have 13 shorts, maybe cash in on say two or three of them. I'm not sure how you can end up with 13 shorts because of the shark covering rally. But yeah, if I had 13 shorts on, I pardon my French, my little French friend used to say, but hey, that sounds like English. But if I had 13 shorts on, I think I'd be scared shitless. You know, I mean, that's just, that's a lot of stocks to have on. And I was actually hoping, I know, hoping one hand and, you know, the other, but I was actually hoping towards this market peak, and I didn't know it was going to peak, but I was hoping, obviously, for more and more of the stocks in my portfolio to hit those initial profit targets so I could take more and more money off so i i just doubt very seriously you would end up with that many shorts on but yeah if you had 13 shorts on then by all means feel free to lighten up on that i use i'm usually not a fan of lightening up even though it would have been effing great to have lightened up before the slide right and the reason i don't suggest lightening up is you never know what stock is going to take off and I thought I had the mother of all examples and it pisses me off and that's just life. But I had a little IPO and it went up like five points a few days ago. And I'm like, that's gonna be my example of why I don't exit everything when the SHTF, right? And unfortunately it went down five points yesterday and stopped me out. But yeah, absolutely. If you've got that much short, then, feel free to start taking lightening up a little bit. But here's the other thing to think about too, okay? And this is where it gets kind of interesting on the short side. So let's say you shorted in the market's way up here. Well, if you got 13 shorts on and the market's sliding, you probably took some profits along the way. So here's the other thing is that your profits are gonna be really big and you're gonna have a bigger cash value because those shorts are decreasing in value. I'm hoping that makes some sense, okay? So if you had that many shorts on, there's a good chance that you've taken a lot of initial profit targets and those shorts are at much, much lower levels. So you've got a lot more cash in your account, a lot more margin available based on that slide, okay? And then you would be giving up open profits on that. Now, as what's his name, Richard Dennis said, or 
Curtis Faith, quoting Richard Dennis, said that Dennis treated drawdowns to open profits differently than open losses. I hear you, but it's known, but you know it's not a company issue, it's a coronavirus issue. What if a cure is found tomorrow? Good point. Good point. I, I think it would be, again, I think it'd be hard to be short 13 stocks unless you, you know, I, I didn't go after 13 stocks on the short side just in case this thing was a, a quick little little flip lower. I think you can get into a lot of trouble going after all those stocks. So I don't know. I, I think we're kind of getting into hypothetical territory. But yeah, I mean, if the market has imploded like this and you wrote it down, at, you know, by all means, feel free to lighten up a little bit. Okay. Now, just a, a few little things. You guys are already on the Facebook group, so uh, most people that are here. But let me just put this announcement out real quick, and then we'll hop into the charts. So if you are a gold member of DaveLandry.com, make sure you join Dave Landry Trend Traders. There's a couple of you guys out there who are anti-Facebook, and I get it, okay? So there's a couple of alias. You could use an alias. We have a few people in our group using an alias just because they want to stay pure about saying they're not technically on Facebook. I probably would not be on Facebook. I mean, who knows uh, if it wasn't for my business, okay? But I do get sucked into conversations like I, I posted a picture of my bidet yesterday, truth be told. So maybe I am getting sucked in that too. But if you don't want to be a member of Facebook, you don't have to be. You can sign up under a bogus alias. Just let me know who you are. But you have to be a gold member, and that's to keep the riffraff out. And as you guys know, we really have a good time. We interact with each other, ask for help. And I think I said last week, sometimes I'll throw something out, and you guys will say, Dave, I don't know about that. That's kind of crazy. It's kind of thin, or Hotel California, meaning that you're going to have a hard time getting out of it, which I did one stock yesterday, I think. And, you know, I've actually maybe changed my mind. So it, it does help to interact with other people. And the good thing is... I will post signs and signals and things like that in the group as they occur and see them ahead of time. Now, I probably jinxed this because I somebody said, hey, Dave, this guy turned 14,000 into 4 million. So I was like, okay, I got to count with 14,000. Maybe I could do that too. But these guys always tell you after the fact how they got lucky. They never tell you what they're going to do. So one thing that I am going to do after I get it, I should be fully in cash now. But I will show the trades that I'm doing in a small account, and I'm working to try to parlay that. But I'm going to do it in real time, and I'm going to do it ahead of time. I'll let you know before any I make any trades there. The other thing, too, and they haven't worked out great lately, truth be told, because the market has been so damn erratic. But I will post opening gap reversals that I'm looking at and ones that I'm actually trading in the group. And so... Overall, it's just been a great thing. Just little things like pointing out, hey, you know, we're close to a circuit breaker or whatever has been really cool. So if you are if you are interested in becoming a member and taking the member courses and interacting in the Facebook group and all those other benefits and features, go to this big old long URL here, daylander.com slash become dash a dash better dash trader dash w dash these dash three dash things need to learn how to shorten a neural okay chief orman really wound up today let me get my chart shared obviously i want to talk a little bit about the markets and then when i get done with that feel free to start asking about stocks now so we don't have a gap but if there's a individual stock or something you want me to talk about feel free to start punching those in now any other unanswered questions Feel free to do that too. So before I forget, let's let's take a look at what's left of the portfolio. I shouldn't say what's left because what happened is the shorts started feeling in. So AMD is a short. We're looking for 37 on the IPT. Not quite there just yet. KOD, I actually use a little discretion. You'll see that it was in the, ooh, probably need to get out of that now though. I wonder if I have a stop on that. Let me just go check real quick. <laughs> Keep them crying. All right, so I'm out of that. Like I say, usually these shows are good because it stops me from trading too much, but sometimes I forget to do something because of the show. ACGL, this is another one of these shorts. So far, it's been pretty good. You know, like Stuart was saying, well, maybe way down here after it imploded so much. 
that's okay if you want to take off some profits. I, I try to follow things as, as through the system as possible. PAGS, another short, you can see banging out some new lows with Vigor. And then DLDL continuing to implode in here down, what, 20%. So, so far, so good on those. So far, not so good on a KOD. I don't know if you could hear the F5 from across the room. But believe me, I do drop them on occasion. Hmm, dropping a lot lately, huh? I mean, that's the thing about the Facebook group. It's like, not that misery loves company, but it does help to be able to talk it over with other people. And as I think I've said last week or week before, or ad nauseum probably, when I spoke a few years back at a conference and they had, for the psychology section, just got a fill, they had Dr. Robert Marr speak and he talked about how it's important for us to interact with other human beings. Hang on, I'm sorry for this. I promise I'll edit it out. I just bought SPXL and GUSH. I don't know if you can hear that. Radical transparency. <laughs> I'm putting in uh, I'm putting in limit orders and I'm putting in trailing stop orders on SPXL and GUSH, GUSH. Okay, sorry about that. That might that might fail miserably. <laughs> I just uh, I just triggered into an SPXL trade. And I just triggered into a GUSH trade. The GUSH is kind of crazy S and G type of thing, but I just let the orders. I'm gonna let the orders work, and I'm trying not to look at the screen too much. Lawrence said, "I'm sorry, I missed spill in AMD too early to book half, not to micromanage." Uh, no, um, you know, and that's what's gonna suck is you're gonna watch it go down, then watch it go back up, and then shoulda, coulda, woulda. But yeah, I think it's a little too early to book half. You know, there are some cases where you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, the market's coming unglued, and you're thinking, and I don't want to think too much in hindsight here, but you're kind of thinking like, well, let me just go ahead and lock and load a little early on this. But it, it didn't quite get far enough or close enough for the first loaf on that just yet. So that's okay that you didn't micromanage. I just fat fingered S XPXL. Did you buy it? What'd you do? Well, I just bought it. We'll see if we get cream. Lately, this market has been a pain in the ass. I've already lost money this morning on a couple of uh, these guys, but we'll see how it works out. But yeah, the XPS XL actually lost money this morning already on that. Not that you want to be a crazy ass day trader, okay? I got some nasty emails from, you know, stop calling me a crazy ass day trader. <laughs> well, you are. What happened with this one was I was a little too aggressive and I triggered in here this morning and I stopped out. And I know it's kind of hard to go back to the well, you know, it's kind of like doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. But sometimes I think you can take a second entry on these things. So I'm now long this and I've got a pretty liberal stop and a pretty liberal IPT, which as soon as the show is over, I'm going to take a look at all this and see what's happening. Trying to place a limit ended up, well, that's what happens when you get excited. He said he tried to place a limit. I mean, we all do it. We all do it. Okay. He tried to place a limit order and he ended up buying at the current price. Well, I don't know why you're doing a limit order unless you're already long. Maybe a stop order would get you in. Yeah, somebody saying that they did really well, that in one day on put options, they did, they made back their whole year. That's possible. All right, let me go through the market real quick. Obviously, we have a big reversal underway. I picked the wrong day to do a show. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, that's just typical markets, you know. Right when it stops you out of the all the longs and gets you really short, okay, then of course it, it comes roaring back. S&P 500 looking a little bit better now than it did at the beginning of the day. We're only down 3%. We were down 8% earlier, as you know, hitting circuit breakers and stuff. I guess I shouldn't complain. At least I'm long something, okay? I'm long X. P X L and I do oh shoot so I do I did trigger on a more than one account so I didn't get all my orders in so we may have to wrap this up in a minute depends on how much it cost me Nasdaq composite nice little gap down today but now it's reversing nicely so far so good there at least for today's intraday action this market has had so much damage. I think there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be these massive rallies, but I wouldn't, let's not start kissing each other just yet, okay? Now, I hope this thing goes, I hope it goes to new highs today, you know, and stops me out of my shorts, I don't care. Anyway, 
nice little rally on that. So far, so good. Russell 2000, this thing has really looked like a turd, to put it mildly. You can see it's just imploded as of late, but nice little intraday reversal there. Now, as you go through these sectors, the sector action just absolutely abysmal. Energy is obviously getting creamed, and that's why I'm looking to play that little gush play. Okay. Do not hold on to these leverage ETFs longer term because they will reverse split you to death. You're probably thinking, oh man, 75 cents or whatever it is, 67. Well, it changes quickly. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to squirrel it away and forget about it. Well, they'll reverse split you to death. And they're getting ready to reverse split it anyway. Energy's imploding. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that this, all these sectors and the overall market has imploded. What's scary is, Gold has imploded with the overall market too. And bonds for a little while were imploding too. And that means that it's a liquidation market. In, in other words, uh, Zach, I can't follow you, Trey, while I'm doing the show. It means that the baby was getting thrown out with the bathwater, but we're getting a little bit of a bounce. Craig says, Fred's Fed surprise. Well, here's the thing they cut the rates from zero. 0.1 to what zero i mean so now they're out of bullets so now we're entering into a really scary phase they have no bullets left and that's when it could get uh it could get ugly fast so hopefully i'll be to break even soon but as you see going through all these sectors they've just all been getting annihilated as of late so here's the thing i can't imagine there's anything left to short okay so we're gonna have to wait for a bounce before looking to get long, I'm sorry, get short, that is, okay. Biotechnology, this one's been kind of a bummer because on an individual issue basis, some of these things have been absolutely taken off. And anyway, all right, let's open it up. Any individual stock questions? I mean, obviously the market's headed lower for now, longer term or intermediate term, but we are in the middle of a bounce. Any other questions before we wrap things up? And you guys that are here live, we could obviously continue on in the Facebook group. All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, thank everybody for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. And again, for those in Facebook, I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much.